right, I'm going to do this quick video to talk about basic refrigerant manifolds, or we call them often gauges. The gauges are actually these two uh, components here, these two parts here. So we'll often call them gauges, but really we should call it a manifold. This part here is the manifold body. And these come in a lot of different types. I've had this set of gauges or this manifold for many, many years. I think, I don't know, probably in the in the ballpark of 12, 13 years, something like that. And I haven't cared for them because I don't use them very often. So I kind of pulled these out. You can see they're, they're not in great shape. The cover's missing on this one. But the first thing to note is that these are what measure the pressure. And then we can convert that pressure into temperatures in order to calculate things like superheat and subcooling. These scales on here on the inside show different temperatures for different refrigerants and when the needle points at those temperatures that's what we call the saturation temperature that goes along with the pressure that's listed on the outside. Same thing here on the high side you see that the gradations change so it's from 0 to 50 here and here 0 to 50 is a much wider range so you see this goes all the way up to 250 psi before it goes starts to go into overpressure. This one here goes all the way up to 500 psi, which is pounds per square inch gauge. The first thing is we calibrate these to atmospheric pressure, which is why it's psig, pounds per square inch gauge, as opposed to pounds per square inch absolute. If we had these calculated or calibrated to pounds per square inch absolute, then we would have to set them to 14.7 psia at sea level in order to measure that pressure. So we are cal calibrating them to zero, at whatever altitude we're at or whatever barometric pressure we're at. So you can see right off the bat that this one right here is a little bit off and I've already got the lens off. So we're gonna go ahead and adjust this to zero it out. You can also see my needle here is a little bit bent, so it's not the best. But we're gonna to wanna to zero this out to atmospheric pressure. In the process, I should take these off the parks too, just to make sure that it's totally open to atmosphere before I do this calibration. All right, I made the common error there of using a term that I didn't explain first. So these are our hoses, and these here are what we call parks. These do not actually communicate into the manifold at all. These actually are blocked off inside, and it's just a place for you to thread your hoses onto, so that way dirt and air and moisture doesn't get inside your hoses. When you have them stored, you want them to be on these parks to prevent that, because we don't want any dirt or anything getting into these hoses. This is what we call our high side gauge, our high pressure gauge. The hose is red for that. Now again, does the color of the hose matter? Not really, but we use these standardized colors so that that way we don't actually get them on the wrong side. The center port here is for our charging and recovery and that's we use yellow for that and then our left side is our low side, our low pressure side and it feeds up into this gauge right here. Now for somebody who's brand new to looking at a refrigeration manifold, the first thing that they assume is that these handles somehow have something to do with what you read on the gauge and the fact is that as soon as I connect this to a source of pressure as soon as I thread this on, it's going to measure the pressure on the gauge. This handle doesn't have anything to do with pressure being read by the gauge. This is open through here regardless of how this handle is turned. What this handle does is it allows communication from the center to the other side. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But like I mentioned, the first thing that we gotta get straight is make sure that our, we are calibrated out to zero on both sides. On this one over here, on the low side, you can also see that this one is also a bit miscalibrated. So before I were to, was gonna put this into use, I would want to open this up, make sure that it's open to atmosphere, and then dial this back to make sure that it's exactly at zero. So that way we're gonna read appropriate pressure. Let's talk about a couple other things here that are very pertinent to this. Um, like I mentioned already, we, you wanna make sure that you don't get any contaminants inside the system. And most systems are gonna come with something called a Schrader core. If you've ever looked at a, uh, a bike tire port or a car tire port, you'll notice that there's a little pin in there and, and you have to depress that pin in order for pressure to go in or out. A refrigerant manifold is similar in that regard. It has a depressor, which you can kind of see there, that pushes down on that pin that's inside of most service valves, especially for air conditioning. They have those Schrader cores inside there. And this pushes down on that pin and allows flow through the port. 
but it's only that way on one side. If I were to open, to open up and show you the other side here that connects to the gauge, you're gonna notice that it's wide open inside here. There's nothing inside this other side that depresses a Schrader, so you can't connect these hoses backwards, otherwise they won't work when you have a Schrader in place. The other thing to know about this, and this comes up when you're doing an evacuation, which means pulling a vacuum or a recovery, these little core depressors that are inside these hoses that are designed for valves that have Schrader ports in them, they do cause a restriction of, to flow. So there's not gonna be as much flow through this because of this little core depressor that sits in the center of that hose, which is fairly obvious. But you wanna make sure that the open part is what connects to the manifold and the part that has the core depressor is what connects to the service valve on your piece of air conditioning equipment. Now there are types of equipment that have what we call um, adjustable back seat, front seat type valves that don't have Schraders in them at all where they actually open and close. And in that case, it wouldn't matter. You wouldn't need a core depressor at all. But most standard refrigeration hoses have core depressors. Another thing here is this is this is a hook. This hook hooks onto your equipment generally to kind of hang your gauges. One thing to be really careful with this hook is do not poke this into your condenser coil. I see a lot of guys beat up units by jabbing this into the condenser coil. You want to be very thoughtful about where you attach this hook so you don't damage anything. Something else to consider is you're going to see some gauges that have a sight glass. That's what this is, and the, the purpose of this is so that when you are charging or recovering, you can actually watch the refrigerant flowing through. This doesn't have a whole lot of practical use other than that you can sort of see the flow and you can know that it's flowing, but it does have uh, one use, which is that when you're charging a system in its liquid phase, which you have to do with many types of refrigerant, like R410A, for example, you have to charge it in its liquid phase, you can watch and make sure that you're not overfeeding with liquid and possibly slugging or flooding a compressor because you don't want to overfeed the liquid. And so that's something that people will use that sight glass for is just to see how much refrigerant is being fed through. Here's the key thing that I alluded to earlier that we want to just make sure that you're completely straight on with this gauge manifold. The reason for these handles is to feed refrigerant through the body, either to this center hose or to the other side. So if I were to open this one and I were to open this one, now refrigerant can flow from this port to the center port and to this port. So all three of them are all mixed. Now let's say I had this connected to the park so that that way now we're only feeding from one side to another. We could use that, for example, if I had a low loss fitting on here and I wanted to feed my liquid back into the suction side of the system. Say I had the suction side still connected to the equipment and I had shut this off with a ball valve. I could feed a liquid refrigerant back into the low side of the system from the high pressure side to the low pressure side by opening both of these. But in most cases, you're only gonna open one at a time. So for charging a system, we're gonna take this one right here, this center hose off the park, and we're gonna connect this to a refrigerant tank that's full of virgin refrigerant, new refrigerant that we were wanting to charge into a system. I can connect that to the tank and then I open up this gauge a little bit and it's gonna feed refrigerant through here and then into the system. Remember, these have nothing to do with whether or not your gauge reached pressure. Your gauge will read whatever pressure is on the hose on this on these ports here, this port here and this port here, regardless of whether or not these handles are open. But as soon as you open this up, now it's going to allow refrigerant to flow from this hose here through the body of the valve of the manifold and then into the low side of the system. The opposite is true for the high side. If I were to connect this to a recovery tank on an operating system and I had high side pressure on here, if I open this valve, it would feed refrigerant out of the system and into the tank. Because on, on an operating functional system, you're going to have lower pressure here and higher pressure here and tank pressure is gonna be somewhere in between. So when you open up from a tank to the low side, it's gonna flow into the system. If I I shut that off and I open up this one, then it's gonna flow from the high side back into the tank. And there are different types of tanks. Charging tanks don't allow flow both directions. The new, you know, modern charging tanks only go out and recovery tanks are designed to take in. There are some applications where you can use recovered refrigerant and put it back into the same system that you took it out of or for the same customer. But largely speaking, we're going to be charging out of a new tank, putting refrigerant into the system by opening this knob into the low side. And if we have to take some out, we're gonna put it into a properly designed recovery tank. We're gonna take it out of the system and put it back in. Now again, I wanna state this very clearly, just like we put in the disclaimer at the beginning. This is for trained professionals only. You are not to do this as a homeowner, as somebody who has no experience and no training, you need to have an EPA certification with the Environmental Protection Agency to handle most of these types of refrigerants. So it's important that you go through all of this, but this is one of the very basics when you first start off in the trades and things you need to know. 
about how a gauge manifold operates. Finally, what I want to say is don't over tighten these knobs. So when I when I turn this valve shut, I'm only finger tightening. That's tight enough. I don't need to put a wrench on it. I don't need to crank it down. If you do that, you're going to run the chance of damaging your seals inside of the valve and then they're going to tend to leak. So whenever you open and close, you're just doing it with finger finger tight. The same thing is true when you attach these onto the system. You don't want to over tighten them because you'll over compress the seals inside here and you'll notice that you have to replace your seals more often. Be very thoughtful about the seals in your equipment. Also, don't overheat these. So if you're brazing on a system, you want to make sure to keep the valves cool so you don't overheat the rubber seals inside. Otherwise, you're going to find that you go through a lot of these seals. And on most gauges, these are replaceable. So there you go. That's the basics for the analog refrigerant manifold. Um, stay tuned for future videos for us to talk about the differences between this and some of the more modern gauge manifolds. Thanks for watching.